Amen. Let's all stand and worship the Lord. It is well with my soul. together. Heavenly Father, as we enter in this time of worship corporately together, that desire for it to be well with our soul, those words even so. Lord, today we come before you with a multitude of struggles and issues and doubts and questions and problems, but God, today we are claiming that even so it can be well with our soul. Help us today, oh God, to only hear your voice no matter what the struggle may be. It is in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Church family, if you'll be seated for just a moment, I want to take a second to welcome you to First Baptist Church of Opelika. 
And this is our third worship hour of the morning. It is a pleasure to see you here in person. Those of you that have joined us, uh, we welcome you. I know many of you are here as a guest or visitor. Uh, maybe you're in town visiting family. Maybe you're new to our community. However the Lord has brought you here, we're very grateful. And you'll hear at the end of the service, we do have a guest reception. We love the privilege of meeting you face to face. Uh, so at the end of the service, if you will uh, allow us that privilege just to, to meet you and get to know your name, we welcome you and we are grateful uh, that you're here uh, this morning. Now there's another group of folks I want to welcome that are those that are watching by way of television, the internet, or listening to 97.7 FM on the radio. You may not be with us here in person, but that does not change the fact that you are worshiping alongside of us. The Bible declares that we worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. And even though I am grateful for each and every one of you who is here on this campus, biblically speaking, those who are not on our campus are worshiping alongside of us as well. So it is a privilege to have you with us. Let's continue as we pray. Heavenly Father, as we continue in this time of worship, Lord, we recognize uh, that there are many folks today who are on this campus, off this campus, but coming before your throne at the same time. And Lord, today, give us that picture of the heavenlies. Give us that picture of the throne room, of the angels who are declaring day and night, of those that have gone before us declaring your praise. May we today join them in declaring who you are for all of eternity. It is in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we sing. Praise God from the
morning. Please pray with me. Lord God, it's a privilege to be gathered here this morning, Lord, to truly worship your name, God, to, to praise you, um, an opportunity to encourage one another, Lord, to pray for one another, um, to lift you up collectively, Lord. God, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for your goodness, your love, and your blessings, Lord. Lord, now we have a time, uh, a privilege, an opportunity to uh, be obedient to you, Lord, and to, to give back, Lord, a portion of what you've given to us. God, we thank you for that. God, we pray that you would use these tithes and offerings to further your kingdom, Lord. And God, we love you and we praise your name. Amen.
Father God, words cannot describe adequately enough your majesty, your glory, your honor. But today, Lord, we simply say we honor you, Lord. We glorify you, King Jesus. We lift you up where you deserve to be higher than anything, God, in all the earth. To be raised, to be lifted in this place. We lift you higher today, Jesus. We lift you, Lord, and praise you for who you are. For as King, as Lord, as God above all gods, we praise you today. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, I want to encourage you to open to two very specific places in the New Testament of your Bible. The Gospel of Mark chapter 4 and 2 Timothy chapter 1. Now, we're going to spend the overwhelming majority of our time today in Mark chapter 4. But in just a few moments, uh, there's a verse that we're going to reference in 2 Timothy chapter 1. And I believe it is so significant to the message today uh, that if able to, you're going to want to put your eyes upon it. So Mark chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 1. As you're finding those respective passages, I want to welcome those of you that are guests and visitors with us today. Not only to First Baptist Opelika, but welcome you in the midst of a journey. Walking through the gospel of Mark, not just for the chronology of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. But more than that, we're seeing that page after page and story after story... Jesus Christ demonstrates himself as the one who can bring deliverance in our life. Now, deliverance is one of those words uh, that when utilized is oftentimes uh, somewhat shuddered about. But the term simply means to be set free. It means to have whatever is hindering or holding someone back released. It can also mean to be removed from a place that is destructive into a place that is desired. So when we speak about deliverance, that is actually something that all of us desire. And as we come to chapter 4, beginning in verse 35 today, one of the most famous stories in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, the calming of the sea. But more than just the miracle that takes place, Jesus Christ himself is going to call out the struggle that the disciples are having. And the struggle they're having is the struggle that each and every one of us has almost on a regular basis in our life. Today, you do not have the privilege of saying this message is for my spouse. You don't have the privilege today of saying this message is for my neighbor, my friend, the person next to me. In fact, at some level, today's message is for each and every one of us without exception. Mark chapter 4, beginning in verse 35. It says, in the same day, when the evening was come, he said to them, let us pass over to the other side. And when they sent away the multitude, they took him even as was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there rose a great storm of the wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. He was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him, and they said unto him, Master, care us not that we perish. He arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace. Be still. The wind ceased. There was a great calm. He said unto them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly. And they said one to another, what manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? What is the subject matter? What does Jesus call out in their lives that they experienced fear? What is fear? By, by simple definition today. We're going to address that fear is something we all struggle with and Jesus Christ alone can deliver us from. But before we deal with the subject matter that affects each and every one of us, just kind of in advance, can I share with you where we're headed? We're going to talk about what fear is. We're going to talk about why it works so well in our lives. And finally, how we can be delivered from it. So let's begin with the what is it. Here's the definition of fear as mentioned in the dictionary. Fear is an emotional response to that which we feel threatened by, endangered by, or the possibility of pain being impacted in our life. That's what it simply means. So anytime we feel threatened, 
Anytime we feel as if danger could occur or pain, whether it be physical, emotional, mental, whatever that is, there is this emotion that wells up within us known as fear. What happens? Why are you so fearful? They felt endangered, did they not? They felt threatened by the storm, and I'm sure at some level there was some pain that was involved. But I want to draw a very specific biblical distinction. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1, there's a statement made in Scripture that we kind of need to, no pun intended, uh, put the anchor in today. For in just a moment, when we come full circle at the end of the text, not only this verse, but the concept behind it will be very relevant. Notice what it says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. So let's talk about the definition. The definition is that which springs up within us endangerment, threatenings, pain. But according to the word of God, those emotions, those responses are not from God. For it says, God has not given us the spirit of fear. So let's describe what fear is. If God hasn't given it to us, then what is fear's source? Allow me to state it very clearly. The pit of hell. That's where it comes from. Satan utilizes fear, maybe more often, more frequently, and better than any other weapon in his arsenal. It says God has not given us the spirit of fear, which means that when it creeps up in our life, it is a tool, it is an instrument of the enemy. But I want you to notice the substance. For God has not given us the spirit of fear. Why is that critical? Because even though in this story the elements of the sea were physical, the boat was physical, everything around them was tangible, the emotions that welled up within them was a spiritual issue, not a physical one. In other words, oftentimes, if not more than oftentimes, fear is a spiritual response to a physical storm. What do we see? A storm. Not just in their life, storms in our life, all around us that the enemy utilizes to cause fear to be a part of our lives. The second question is simply this. Why does it work so well? You know, one thing the enemy has learned is he doesn't have to come up with any new tools. They've been working for years and for decades. They've been working for millennia. In fact, the same item known as fear, we're going to see in just a moment, is actually what the enemy used in the Garden of Eden to convince us to eat the forbidden fruit. How does fear work? Why is it so effective in our lives? Well, the first thing we notice is that it's predatory. It preys upon us. And I want you to see what happens in verse 36. It says, when they sent away the multitude, they took even as was in the ship. They were also with them other ships. And there arose a great storm of the wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. You say, why is that predatory? Because they never saw it coming. And that's how the enemy works in our life when it comes to fear. These were professional fishermen. I mean, you have no record of Jesus saying, okay, let's go to the other side. And them saying, oh, I don't know, Jesus, it looks pretty bad out there. There's no record of Jesus according to the skies. I don't know if this is a smart idea. In other words, when they set sail that night, they had no idea what laid ahead of them. They had no idea what was coming just hours away. And is that not how the enemy uses fear in our life? That which wells up within us, we never scheduled it. We never put it on our spreadsheet and we never saw it coming. Very reminiscent of Genesis chapter 3. Their humanity is in the Garden of Eden. It says that the serpent, the same instrument of fear, comes to them. says, yea, hath God said. And when you think about it, the whole dialogue between the serpent and the woman is about fear. There's an acronym that's used today in our culture. It's called the fear of missing out. If you don't eat of this fruit... You're going to miss out on greater things than even you're experiencing today. Isn't it interesting that the enemy used fear in the Garden of Eden, and he still uses it today, but he's a predator. And much like, and I know in our context here geographically, so many of us understand and this resonates, he's much like a deer hunter in the blind. I mean, think about it for a moment. 
if you are personally or if you know somebody who is an advocate, just, I mean, an avid deer hunter, they will always talk about the fact that they spend more time doing nothing than they do doing something. It's true. In fact, I've heard guys say, I finally got the buck I've been watching for years. Why? Because it wasn't the right time. When you're watching that which you want to prey upon, you want to make sure that you don't miss. So how do you make sure you don't miss is you make sure that you get them at the time that they least expect it to happen. Isn't that how the enemy works in our lives? He brings things into our lives that we didn't plan for, uh, we didn't have on our calendar of events, and those, quote, storms arise. Not only does fear work because it's predatory, but it's also very particular. And what I mean by particular is it will impact you differently than it may impact somebody else. Back to verse 36 and 37, I want you to see something in the Gospel of Mark that is actually not a part of the story in Matthew and in Luke, but I think it resonates so well. When they'd sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship, and there were also with him other little ships. Now, for many of us, we've known the story of Jesus calming the sea since we are in vacation Bible school. I mean, it's one of those stories that we just know so well. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you to shout amen. But how many of you today for the very first time said, what? I didn't know there were other boats. In fact, the story's been told for years and years. We just think big sea of Galilee, one boat, big storm, get to the other side. But what does it say? There were also with him other little ships. Look in verse 37. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was full. Now, I never want to be guilty of reading something into Scripture, but do you find it interesting? There's multiple ships, but only one boat is being mentioned as having water over the edge. Now, God is able to create a storm that would only impact one of these boats, or the other boats may have been impacted, we're just not told. However, based on the fact that you've got a plural in verse 36 and a singular in verse 37, tells me that's how fear operates. It is so particular that that which causes fear in your life may not cause fear in somebody else's life. That which wells up those emotions in yourself may not even be the same for your own spouse, your family, your co-workers, etc. See, fear is so particular because the enemy is a predator. And he knows what will cause it in your life. He knows how to cause it in a culture's life, a community's life. He is so particular with it that he will use a strategy in person A that he may not use in person B. However, even though he's very particular... We see that these guys are paralyzed by fear. Notice verse 38. When he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow, they awoke him and they said unto him, Master, care us not that we perish. He said, well, how do we know that they were paralyzed? How do we know uh, that they weren't able to move? The men on that boat that day were professional fishermen. That's what they did. They had grown up. They had spent their entirety of their lives on the very... Sea of Galilee that this event took place in. And you're telling me that this is the worst storm they've ever seen? You're telling me that this is the worst waves they've ever experienced? Oh, it could be. But even if it is, they responded in a very paralyzed manner. And by, what I mean by paralysis is unable to make proper decisions. Unable to respond in, in a proper manner. Professional fishermen, right? Right? So why is it that they didn't do anything that a normal fisherman would do to alleviate the situation? In fact, there's an Old Testament story that works perfectly with this. It's called Jonah. We know Jonah, one of the minor prophets in the Old Testament. The Lord calls him to go to Nineveh. By the way, he's the only prophet. The Lord specifically says, go to the Gentiles. He says, I don't want to go to the Gentiles. I hope they go to hell. I was just seeing if you're awake, because that's literally what he said. I don't want them saved. I don't want them to call out to God. I'm going the other way. So he hires a boat, goes in the bottom of the boat, storm comes up, he goes to sleep. Do you notice an interesting parallel here? Jonah's asleep in the bottom of that boat, Jesus is asleep in the bottom of this one. So here we've got a group or a crew on the boat in Jonah who are a bunch of heathens. 
I mean, they were worshiping all kinds of false gods. When the storm came up, what's the first thing they did? They took buckets and tried to get all the water out. That's what any, I'm not even a good fisherman, and I know to do that. If water's coming in, water needs to go out. That's what you do. You know the second thing they did in Jonah? They took the cargo that was not necessary, and they threw it overboard. In other words, they eliminated all items that could hinder the process. And then finally, when there was nothing else left, what did they do? They woke up the guy that was asleep. They said, a, a stranger, could you come up here? I, I think we got a problem that you may have the answer to. You notice what happens here? They go straight to the bottom of the boat. They didn't pull out any water. They didn't throw anything overboard. Why is that significant? Because that's what fear does in our life. When the enemy preys upon us, when he strategically attacks in our life with those storms of life, fear has set in when we're unable to process properly, when we're unable to make proper decisions. When we just listen, we allow the storm to dictate our lives rather than our decisions to guide us through the storm. So why does it work so well? Because we're actually dealing with a tool of the enemy. The enemy uses fear to get us to not only feel threatened, endangered, and in pain, but to become incapable of thinking properly or acting properly. These guys did everything they shouldn't have done because they were fearful. So here's the big question. How do we get delivered from fear? How do we not go the same road they went? How do we find it in our lives to have the story written a little bit differently than these guys. Well, there's three real pretty simple things that we've got to do. The first thing is this. we got to look up. Now, I know you expect me to say what I'm about to say. We need to, quote, look up to the Word of God. I know you expect that. Psalms 121 says, look to the hills. That's where our hope comes from. But can I remind you of something? This may be one of those verses you've never noticed in the Bible. In Psalm 138, verse 2... It says, thou hast magnified thy word even above thy name. Now think about that for a moment. If the word of God, according to Jesus Christ, is above his name. In fact, he said, heaven and earth will pass away. My word will never pass away. Then when the storms come up, when fear creeps in, the first thing we need to do is actually look to the word of God. What does it say? Well, notice what it says here in verse 39. Peace be still. He calmed the waters, right? That's wonderful. But can I call your attention to verse 35? And the same day, when it was evening to come, he said unto them, let us pass to the other side. Now let me share with you the significance of what we just read. The same voice that said, peace be still, is the same voice that created the heavens and the earth. The same voice that said, peace be still, is the same voice that in Hebrews 1.3 says that all of the creative order is in place because he speaks it into place. And the same voice that said, peace be still, is the same voice that in verse 35 said, we're going to the other side. Why is that important? Because how many times in the midst of a storm... How many times when fear creeps in, you cry, God, do you not care that this is happening? I need you to calm this. When he's already spoken, he's going to get you through it. You know some of the last words Jesus gave us in Matthew 28? I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Yet how many times has the devil used fear in your life and you've cried, God, are you sure you can get me through this? He's already said it. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I find it interesting that the same voice that calmed the storm is the same voice that said you're going to the other side. Now he didn't share with them there was going to be a storm. He didn't share with them the magnitude of the storm but he said we're getting there. He didn't even say we're getting there and it's going to be rough. He said we're going to the other side. Philippians 1 verse 6 makes this statement that he being Jesus who began a good work in you will continue until the time of Christ Jesus. So when that fear creeps up and you question, we have the word of God telling us we're going to get to the other side. We have the word of God telling us he's not going to leave us. He's not going to forsake us. Can I help you out just a little bit? Let me help you. Let me give you a little exercise. Now for some of you, 
I mean, this is going to be a radical revolutionary endeavor. You ready? Turn off the TV. Turn it off. You say, what do you mean, turn it off? Because that may be the instrument the enemy uses the most to implement fear in your life. Is it just me, or does it seem like every news story is couched under the umbrella of fear? Every one of them. Make us feel threatened. Make us feel endangered. Make us cautious or concerned about pain that could happen uh, in our life. And can I ask a very rhetorical yet particular question? When's the last time they got one of them right? Have you ever noticed that? You know, we're a whole lot like the guys in the Old Testament who fought Samson who had the jawbone of a donkey. Y'all know that story, right? Samson has this jawbone of a donkey, and a thousand guys come against him, and he kills every single one of them. Here's the part about the story that I love. 999 dead guys, and the last guy must be from the south, says, I can take him. I got him. How many times do we hear news story after news story of fear, 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 and we wake up and say, well, maybe today it'll be better. We're doing the same thing, are we not? And every time we get this information and every time we get all this data and whatever it may be, the way to overcome fear is we've got to see what does the Bible say? Or what they're telling me, does that line up with what Scripture says? Because in the midst of the storm, they questioned whether God had it, and he had already told them they were going to go to the other side. See, we've got to look up. Then we've got to look out. Now, remember the other little ships that are there? Now, I don't know exactly the extent of the storm, and that's a good study to have. But you notice that these professional fishermen did not ask anybody else around them for any guidance or wisdom. In other words, how are you doing over there? What are your tactics? How are you pulling this off? How are you handling the storm? Listen, they were so focused on the storm in their life, they missed everything else that was going on around them. You know, let me remind you, the night before Jesus Christ's crucifixion, goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, gets bounced back and forth between a bunch of rulers and dictators and such. He eventually ends up at Caiaphas' palace, the high priest. It's a very famous story, not just because they try him illegally, but there was a man there by the name of Simon Peter, who can we just agree, goes a little sideways. In fact, remember Jesus told him, uh, before the cock crows three times, you will deny me three times. Hmm. You know, Simon Peter, we give him a bad rap, but can we admit he was one of the better ones? I mean, when Jesus said, who do you say that I am? Remember, he's the one that said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. When Pentecost came in Acts chapter 2, who was it that preached the sermon? Simon Peter. And when it came to choosing between his own life and Jesus, eventually, at the end of his life, he chose martyrdom. Now, I know he stuck his foot in his mouth a whole lot of times. But he also was one of the only two disciples who ran to the empty tomb on resurrection morning. Why is that critical? Because at Caiaphas' house, Peter was on the porch. There he was watching all that was taking place. And they came up to him. And they said, oh, you're one of those guys. You're one of his disciples. Remember what he said? Oh, no, no, no. I don't know who you're talking about. No, no. I'm not one of them. Then the Bible says that a young lady came and said, oh, but you're from Galilee. I can hear it in your speech. You must be one of his. He started cussing. I mean, he starts just letting them fly. And then finally, someone says, I know you're one of his followers. You know what he had the audacity to say? I've never met the man. That is a bold face lie. It took place on the porch of Caiaphas' palace. Why is that significant? Because in John chapter 18, the Bible says that when Jesus went into Caiaphas' palace, the Bible says there was another disciple with him on the inside. We're not given his name. There's a chance it could have been the Apostle John because he was the beloved, the one that was nearest to him. It could have been one of the 70. We don't know. But what we do know is this. While Peter was on the porch, fearful of the storm that was brewing in his life, 20 feet away, there was somebody in the inner chamber with Jesus Christ himself. See, we need to look up what does the Bible say about this scenario that's causing fear. Can I give you the second one? You need to look out. You need to find somebody who's closer to Jesus than you are. That disciple was in the inner chamber. Peter was on the outside. 
And if the guy on the inside can weather that storm, then Peter should have been able to weather his. How many times we get so caught up in what's happening in our lives, we never look out and see what's happening in other people's. And then last but not least, you need to look in. Notice what Jesus says at the end of this passage, verse 40. Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? He calls them those of fear. He questions their faith. Why is this critical? Because these are the same men that saw him turn water into wine. These are the same men that just the previous chapter saw him take a a man who had been withered in the hand his entire life and make it whole. This is the same man that would multiply the food and, and countless other miracles. It's much like the idea of, he told you you're going to get a cross. Why are you questioning the storm? If he's able to do those things, why can he not handle this? You know, James chapter 1 verse 8 says, A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Fear is that item that the enemy uses in our life on a regular basis. He preys upon us. He brings items and words into our lives he may not bring into other people's lives. And he paralyzes us. But if we will just look up to what God has said, if we'll just look out to other believers who are walking closer to Jesus than we are, and if we will just look inside and realize, if Jesus Christ can raise from the dead, I think he's got this one too. Then we will not succumb to the same fear these guys did. See, The reason that we give into fear time and time again is because we focus so much on the storm in our boat and we never look up, out, or in to the testimony of what God desires to do in spite of the storm to get us through the storm. Let's pray with our heads bowed, our eyes closed. As we come to the close of our service today, You know, maybe you're that individual today, whether here in person, online, maybe even driving around town and listening to the radio. Maybe you're that individual this morning who would be willing to confess and admit that you spent the overwhelming majority of your life listening to the wrong voices. When if we would just look up to what the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, it says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And maybe today you're in that place, that position of life. You've tried to navigate it yourself. You've tried to make the decisions for yourself. You've listened to every voice but the Lord's voice. Maybe today's that day where you finally call in the name of the Lord to be saved. The great news about that passage of Scripture is it doesn't talk about a course to take, a test to pass, a hoop to jump through. It just says if you cry out, he'll answer, he'll forgive, and he will save. Maybe today you're that person, you're at the end of your proverbial rope, and it is time to call out to Jesus. Can I encourage you to do so? You don't have to say maybe the same phrase that I or others might say. You don't have to do so out loud. But maybe your heart's cry today would be something like this. God, I can't do this anymore. I I can't keep walking down this path. I can't keep making these decisions. I can't keep feeling these responses. God, I can't do it on my own. God, I believe today. That Jesus Christ is the only one who can do it in my stead. God, I believe. I believe that I got a sin problem that only Jesus can fix. God, I believe that Jesus Christ loved me so much that he was willing to be born on my behalf. God, I believe that Jesus Christ loves me so much that he resisted all temptations of man. He lived a sinless life on my behalf. And God, I believe that when he allowed himself to be nailed to the cross of Mount Calvary, He paid the price for my sin, my indiscretions, my transgressions. God, he took the punishment that rightfully should have been mine. And God, I believe that three days later, when he rose from the grave, when he conquered death, he actually made it feasible and possible for my sins to be forgiven, my soul to be saved. God, today, I don't have all the answers to the struggles, the issues, and the problems of life. But there is one thing I do know. That Jesus Christ is the only answer to my sin problem. So the best way I know how, I'm calling out to you. I'm asking you to forgive me. I'm asking you to save me. I just want to turn my life over to you. This morning, if you're here in person, maybe you're that one who cried out to the Lord. In a moment, I'm going to pray for us. We're going to stand and sing together. Can I encourage you just to step out and step forward? 
Be that person to say, you know what, I need, I need to talk to somebody. I need to be prayed with. I need to be prayed for. I need to understand more. Maybe you're that person today who's at the end of that rope, says, I need to step out and step forward. I need to talk with somebody. But you know, maybe today you're that person saying, you know, I had that conversation with the Lord years ago. I've been saved for decades. But fear has ravaged your life. Maybe today is not about stepping out and stepping forward. Maybe today is about leaving the campus in just a few moments. Willing to look up to see what the Bible says in spite of the latest information. Being, being willing to look to those who walk closer with Jesus than you do rather than just whoever is in your corner. Or maybe looking back on how Jesus has worked in your life in days past and deciding not to question how he's working in days present. Maybe it's not about stepping out and stepping forward. Maybe it's about stepping off this campus with a whole new perspective on life. Lord Jesus, as we come to this time of decision, thank you. Thank you, God, that we do not have to be subjected to fear. We don't have to live life of fear. God, that we do not have to have those voices dictate the storms in our life. Help us today to only hear your voice. It is in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. If you would stand with me as Bruce leads us, whatever decision, we'll be right here at the front. Come every soul by sin oppressed, there's mercy with the Lord. And He will surely give you rest by trusting in His Word. Only trust Him, only trust Him, only trust Him now. He will save you, He will save you, He will save you now. For Jesus shed His precious blood, rich blessings to bestow. Plunge now into the crimson flood that washes white as snow. Only trust Him, only trust Him, only trust Him now. He will save you, He will save you, He will save you now. Church family, if you'll be seated for just a moment, just a couple things to share with you. The most uh, primary of those is maybe you're that person today that maybe you need to be prayed for, prayed with. Maybe there's a decision uh, that you're wrestling with the Lord about. The opportunity to respond has not come to a close. In fact, in just a moment, at the end of the service, to my right, your left, you'll see some folks pretty easily identifiable. And we just want you to know we have a whole team set aside. We have a room set aside to give you the time that you need. We know oftentimes that one or two verses at the end of the service, you're thinking, man, I have a whole lifetime uh, to unpack. We would love that opportunity and privilege today. Well, I'm going to talk about this evening in a moment, but I want to give you an update. You know, it's not often you come to church and get a candy update, but I'm going to give you a candy update. October the 31st, our fall festival, here we go. We have received, before the doors opened this morning, 1,565 pounds of candy. Now, if you're watching on TV or listening on the radio, do not wreck your car. You heard me right. That's a lot of candy. Our goal is to have 5,000 pounds of candy to give to our community October the 31st. So let me remind you for the rest of this month, two things you need when you come to church. You need a Bible and a bag of candy. All right, so bring those two items. I heard this morning they've already taken many, many carts back to the kids building with the candy. Thank you, thank you, thank you in advance. It is one of my goals to go to local places of business and see empty candy bins. All right, so that knows that we are together. Now, speaking of coming together tonight, in six hours in this very place, you have the opportunity of a lifetime. Uh, Miss Babby Mason and the Voices of Lee are going to be here in concert now, I know what some of you are thinking, oh, it's Sunday evening, I'm going to kick back at home, relax, and watch it on TV. Sorry, we can't do that uh, due to some of the copyright laws regarding her music. So if you want to enjoy it, you're going to need to be here in person tonight at 6 o'clock. Now, some of you may not know who Babby Mason is, but can I share with you, she's one of those very unique souls. She's got a gear that most people don't have. 
You know what I mean by I mean, her voice can go places other voices can't go. And she's bringing with her the voices of Lee. And our own choir is going to be joining her as well tonight. So we thought we'd give you a little taste. Tonight at 6 o'clock, there is no cost. Please come and just enjoy this musical gift. Just a little taste, Miss Babby. And then Alan's going to come close our service. First Baptist, my name's Megan and thanks so much for being here today. I would like to take a few minutes and share a couple of things coming up for you and your family. Hey buddy, what you doing? Putting daylight saving time in its place. In a, in a vat of acid? Yeah, it's still an hour for me last spring and it's not, I repeat, not getting another one. You know you get that hour back, right? Or you just you say clocks back in the fall and get that hour back. But I destroyed all the clocks. How am I supposed to get that hour back? How? Skit Guys will be here October 20th in the Worship Center at 6.30. For more info, check out our website. We're looking forward to hosting our first fall festival on the square on October 31st. This is going to be a huge outreach for our community as we invite thousands to come and spend time in the Courthouse Square and enjoy food trucks, candy, BMX stunts, and incredible fireworks. We need you to help us with three big items. We need lots of candy. We are planning on having 5,000 pounds of candy and every little bit helps. Feel free to drop bags of candy off at the church office during the week or at the desk in the children's building on Sundays and Wednesdays. If you are interested in being a decision counselor for our October 31st Fall Festival, you need to attend at least one of these three training options. Sunday, October 17th and October 24th at 6 p.m. in the Worship Center, Wednesday, October 27th in the Worship Center at 6.30. Make sure to stay connected with us throughout the week. Go to our website at officiopolica.com and on all social platforms. Don't forget, tonight at 6 p.m. in the Worship Center, we will have Babby Mason and Voices of Lee. Have a great afternoon. One announcement is that this Wednesday night we'll have a special business meeting in order for us to carry on some business and, and vote on some committee members. We have some that are changing out, some new ones that are coming on, so we'd love for you to be a part of that. But also, tomorrow night at 7 o'clock in this room is prayer time for our fall festival. We've been having those each night. A different staff member will lead each time. And folks, all the candy, all the fun, all the fireworks, it's all about that 15 minutes when our pastor shares the gospel. And we need to get ready for that. Uh, we just need to pray that God will start a revival in us and throughout our city and, and use that as a catalyst. So we invite you to come tomorrow night for one hour, seven to eight, in this room to pray. Let's all stand and we'll be dismissed. As Pastor, Pastor mentioned earlier, if you're our guest, he would love to meet you. We have some folks over here on your left that will take you right to where he is as soon as I say amen. Let's pray. God, thank you for your love for us. And Lord, thank you that we don't have to live in the spirit of fear. God, help us to boldly go and to boldly share and uh, boldly live uh, the life you've given us. God, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.